Well, good evening. Uh, what a treat. I want to be clear, I was in charge of the weather. Uh, uh, Monica was in charge of the meal. Wasn't that terrific? Actually, uh, Angela uh, as well uh, was a very important part of this. Angela has been a huge part of the life of the initiative. And this, she reminded me, this is her last big event. And I said, oh, you don't get off that easily. She'll have to come back. But uh, she has just been an enormous asset to us in our first four years. So uh, please recognize Angela. Well, it's been uh, a great two weeks together. <laughs> it just feels that way. Uh, yesterday, we had a lot of input, uh, analysis, some data, some reflection on the causes and costs of polarization. Today was much more a day of conversation and discussion, although we began with a very powerful panel on how Catholic social teaching could bring us together. Sometimes that teaching tests us as we watch. Sometimes it divides us. It always challenges us. And then we spent most of the day together talking about those principles and their applications and how they might contribute to the common good in a very divided nation. And then uh, we went to confession. Uh, some of us went to confession. All of us had a penance service. I was looking for a blind, deaf confessor. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I just talked really softly. Um, but tonight we move from conversation among ourselves to listening to some respected leaders who know us, who know Catholic social teaching, but are not formally a part of our family. They're sort of our in-laws, uh, in a way. Uh, we have a wonderful outside panel uh, with uh, a columnist, a journalist, uh, uh, an academic, a professor here at Georgetown, and then someone who puts together forums for civil dialogue. I, I said to Cherry, we have to get together uh, soon and talk about how we do this. And it's moderated by uh, somebody who's not an outsider. I said to Mark, you're there for simultaneous translation. Uh, and David said, we'll handle transubstantiation. Mark can handle the rest. Uh, so it's my task to briefly introduce our guests, and let me get, begin with Michelle. Michelle Borstein is a religion reporter at the Washington Post, has been for many years, is one of the most distinguished religion reporters in the country, has several times won the Religious Reporter of the Year Award. Uh, she had a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard. Um, and she and her colleagues, let me just say, there are a lot of bad things going on in Washington. One of the good things is that the Washington Post is investing in first-rate coverage of religion. Michelle. Uh, Michelle and her colleagues have been doing amazing work. Uh, Julie Zosmer was a part of our discussion of the Republican Party a couple weeks ago. But if you've not been reading it, they have just done a remarkable uh, piece of work in reporting on sexual harassment and abuse in the Southern Baptist community. And uh, we know something about the pain that they are experiencing, and we know something about how hard it is to get an institution to face its sins in that area. So Michelle is a good friend, and it's just wonderful to have her with us. Uh, Terrence Johnson is uh, from Georgetown. He's not from Georgetown. He is at Georgetown. He is a professor in the theology of department and government, the, uh, theology department and government. That's a little like the pro-life and social justice wings of the church. You know, we're part of the same team, but we don't always act like it. He's also affiliated with the Department of African American uh, Studies. Uh, he is a specialist on the intersection of faith and public life, especially in terms of the African American church. And if I, this is my opinion, but if you were to look at the religious community that best exemplifies Catholic social teaching without talking about it, it would be the African American church. And we have a lot to learn 
uh, from uh, what they do. Uh, he's a graduate of Morehouse and Harvard, and his major book is on W.E. Du Bois. So uh, we're very pleased to have our colleague, uh, Terrence, here. Uh, thirdly is Cherry. i got to get the right page here. She is the president of the Trinity Forum. That's a very Catholic name. Uh, since 2008, which promotes civil, respectful, substantive dialogue. We think that's a very important work. Uh, she's worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Bill Friss, for Senator Brownback. She's worked with the National Endowment for Humanities, Empower America, which was a, a terrific source of ideas in the conservative movement. Uh, she also has a Harvard connection. And for uh, people here, she is an advisor to the Democracy Fund, which is one of the supporters of the initiative in this gathering. But you probably have heard her name in connection with her work with President George W. Bush, where she was uh, an assistant. And she was director of Barbara Bush's uh, work, director of policy and projects. And if we remember uh, the great contributions that uh, Barbara, not Barbara, Laura Bush, I'm sorry, Laura Bush has made to our country. So we're very glad to welcome her. And then we come to uh, someone no one knows, uh, <laughs> David Brooks, uh, New York Times columnist. Uh, he's on PBS with somebody. I'm not sure exactly who that other person is. Uh, NPR, uh, Meet the Press. Uh, David comes out of the conservative movement. He has worked for National Review. He's now doing all sorts of different things. But for those of us who read him on a regular basis, what has been interesting is the rest of us wring our hands about the state of politics. David has been going deeper and more broadly. And that is about questions of character, questions of leadership. Uh, one of his columns, if you haven't seen it, is what moral heroes are made of. Uh, he has a new project, uh, I believe it's called the Social Fabric Project, which tries to lift up leaders of character and seems like a very timely initiative. And uh, I mentioned David's partner at on the PBS NewsHour. Mark Shields is our moderator. As I said, uh, he's a product of Notre Dame and the Marine Corps, an interesting combination. He's been a huge supporter of and a uh, participant in the work of the initiative since its founding. Uh, as I mentioned, he's been a political consultant for several losing presidential campaigns. <laughs> Most importantly, today, uh, he worked in the Robert F. Kennedy campaign. And today we talked about what those ideals and that kind of leadership could have made for this country. Uh, one of my most vivid memories of Mark uh, involved my parents and an anniversary of the Robert F. Kennedy uh, assassination. We were at Arlington for a mass, and I had arranged for my parents to be Eucharistic ministers so they could see all that was going on. And I said, there's Jacqueline Kennedy, and there's John Kennedy, and Carolyn Kennedy, and all that. And they seemed modestly uh, impressed. And then as we were leaving, I heard my mother shriek, there is Mark Shields. <laughs> and true story. And uh, my dad would call me every Friday and would say, what Mark needs to tell David tonight. And uh, then he would call back and say, it was OK. <laughs> But Mark has been a great friend uh, for the initiative to Georgetown. And uh, we wanted somebody who knew the church from the inside to sort of lead this discussion. So Mark's most distinguished uh, qualification for this panel is he takes up the Sunday collection at Blessed Sacrament Parish. So <laughs> join me in welcoming this great panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, John. Um, it's good to see Monsignor Ensler here, uh, my former pastor at Blessed Sacrament. Uh, Blessed Sacrament, for those of you who don't know, is a 
a church that sits on the Chevy Chase, Washington, D.C. line and is a, a diverse parish ideologically, if not always ethnically. Um, and uh, at the handshake of peace each Sunday, uh, I was lucky enough one Sunday to stand in there as Ted Kennedy turned around to shake hands and right behind him was Bill Bennett. Uh, and he was supposed to say peace, and, uh, and both of them kind of mumbled it out uh, as, uh, as best they could. But uh, it's, uh, it, it is a, it's a wonderful parish, and that, those are my qualifications as a theologian. I'm here in the midst of all of these impressive uh, uh, men of the cloth, women of the cloth, uh, and hoping that I will get the answer to the question that I've asked since I was uh, uh, made my first communion some 75 years ago. Um, and uh, listening to the epistles of St. Paul, and that question remains, did the Corinthians ever write back? Uh, and, uh, but the, uh, the, the mention of, of Robert Kennedy, I think, is, is appropriate to tonight's subject. Uh, it, it, just this, this one quote uh, as a tribute to Robert Kennedy, um, his... Uh, uh, Robert Kennedy's commitment, uh, this is uh, given by a major national figure in the United States. Robert Kennedy's commitment uh, to his great ideals, his devotion to those less fortunate uh, than himself, are matters of history. He roused the comfortable, he exposed the corrupt, he remembered the forgotten, inspired his countrymen, and renewed and enriched the American conscience. And now, um, those remarks were given by a man who graced American politics, whom I happen to disagree, but he did grace American politics. He left uh, the country uh, and the presidency a strengthened institution, and that was Ronald Reagan. Um, now, it's unthinkable in our present climate uh, that a major conservative leader could speak uh, so glowingly and personally, uh, or in reverse, a, conver a, uh, a liberal leader could speak about a fallen conservative. Um, and uh, it, it was a, a testimony uh, to a time uh, when our, our politics was better. I mean, we do run faster today. Our stock market is higher. Um, our education levels are higher. Uh, but our politics is uh, uh, far uh, less forgiving and far less uh, fun and far less functional uh, than, it, uh, than, it, than they were. Um, and certainly they were when Ronald Reagan uh, was president and Ronald and Robert Kennedy was running, and not to minimize the tensions of, of those of that era uh, and the deep divisions in the country. And I, I, just two quick personal notes on the subject, and that is, uh, and John has heard me on this, uh, you can tell the health of any institution, public uh, or religious, uh, by simple t test. And that is whether, in fact, that institution, that political party, that religious faith uh, is seeking converts or it's searching for heretics. Um, and uh, I think uh, when you, it's a sign of weakness when you're searching for heretics, uh, when you're looking for someone who deviates uh, in the slightest semicolon uh, from the inherited line. Um, and whereas the, the welcoming of converts, the, the, the open arms, uh, the embrace uh, is, a, is an act of, of confidence and, uh, it, in my judgment, uh, the hallmark uh, of a growing and healthy institution. Um, and I, I think right now our, our political parties are, have been too often uh, in, the heretic, uh, in the heretic position, in the heretic stage. It was driven home to me uh, by a, a recent event uh, just this past weekend. Um, and uh, emphasizing the importance of listening, not to whom is speaking, to, uh, but rather to what that person is actually saying. Uh, and I think an open mind has to do that. And uh, this was, it was taught brilliantly by an 18-year-old named Ben Bowling. Does anybody know Ben Bowling? Uh, ben, ben Bowling is 18 years old. Um, he was valedictorian in his Bell County High School class. He was graduation speaker. Um, I should point out that Bell County, uh, where Ben went to school, voted 81% for the Republican ticket in November of 2016. And he uh, quoted a leader's words, and this was the quotation he gave. 
don't just get involved. Fight for your seat at the table. Better yet, fight for a seat at the head of the table. Donald J. Trump. The crowd burst into applause until Ben Bowling added, just kidding, that was Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, the crowd fell into silence. Uh, the very quote that had been cheered uh, in the first instance that now became heresy. Um, I think that is just too often uh, the case that they had been re realizing to been listening to the source uh, rather than to the substance. And I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, John Carr is, a, is an old and, and esteemed friend. There are people you meet in, like, uh, in life whom you <coughs> like, and you meet other people whom you meet and you respect. Uh, John is uh, somebody whom I've met and, uh, and continue to respect and to like. Um, he, uh, he, he asked me, uh, Mark, you believe in free speech? I said, I do. He said, good, you're giving one. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, and, and, and then, then, not satisfied with that, John said, now I'm going to ask you to write a check. Uh, and, uh, which, uh, so I, I don't know what it is. And my wife, Ann, is here. I apologize, Ann, because my checkbook is unbalanced. But uh, John Carr is uh, the, the reason. And just be, before I toss it to my, because I'm here to moderate, not to pontificate, I, I do, it would be inappropriate of me not to mention Monsignor Ensler, who uh, does such a magnificent job of, of leading Catholic charities in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, just three short years ago, when Pope Francis uh, came to the United States and came to Washington um, and uh, accused John of running the Washington office of Pope Francis, uh, I think this is really what it is. It is John's Catholic initiative here at Georgetown. But uh, you just dream. Anybody who's ever been near a political campaign, you see this towering figure, this magnificent man, uh, this charismatic, compelling individual speaking to the Congress of the United States, both sides yearning to hear every syllable. John Boehner behind the, the Speaker of the House openly crying in, in joy. He was so thrilled to be part of bringing Pope Francis to the, the Congress. Joe Biden, uh, just as happy as, as he was. And uh, afterwards, you're thinking, boy, You've got a fundraiser coming up at this lunch. It is going to be big. It's really going to be big. I mean, we can get every big roller in the world, everybody who's ever wanted an annulment or thought of anything else, we can line them up and get six-figure checks, OK? And <clears throat> instead, where does the Holy Father go? He goes to Washington, DC, to meet with the homeless, the despairing, the, those on the, on the the fringes of life, um, and uh, those without any clout, uh, without any status, without any checkbook, and there because the good shepherd, John Ensler, brought them. And uh, I just did. It, it says great things about, about both men. So let me, I told Michelle I've been, I've been uh, a longtime reader, first time caller. I've never met Michelle. I've been reading her and enjoying her uh, and learning from her for years. And uh, I'm going to begin with a question right around uh, to, uh, to ask, uh, um, you know, you are outsiders to be candid with us. Don't worry about hurting our feelings. Um, where uh, religious faith contributes uh, to polarization uh, and to, uh, uh, and if anything, uh, to, uh, to division, and uh, whether and, and how uh, it, it can help overcome the polarization which paralyzes and, uh, and afflicts our, uh, our society. Michelle. Um, is this thing on? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I, well, first of all, I don't necessarily feel so much like an outsider. Um, maybe okay. that's my, sort of my perspective on religion, which is um, that we've kind of had these categories that have been very meaningful for how we've talked about our religious identity and groupings. And really, I think that's been not exactly unraveling, but losing its primacy in the last you know, 10 or 12 years, which is when I've been covering religion. So one of the things that I, that I do think about is whether there, you know, whether, there is, um, whether there is a Catholic identity. Like in a lot of the questions, it's sort of saying, you know, what is the Catholic community? What it, you know, I just have found uh, just you know, when you're day in and day out trying to write about this stuff, that those labels 
kind of can hit you into a dead end pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've been looking at, which I think is maybe why John asked me to come, that I looked at when I was on this fellowship you mentioned, was just whether there are other ways, not that those aren't important, uh, important part of, parts of who we are, but whether there's other ways to think about what groupings we're in spiritually, religiously, you know, how we practice, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so just to think about you know, the ways that religious groups have, been, have contributed to polarization is maybe, not, maybe rethinking what are people's truest religious longings and values and beliefs. And maybe these labels, not to push us towards other labels, but maybe the, the tribes that we call ourselves is not always the most productive way to think about things. Um, that said, I think that, that Catholics do have some, I mean, having written about American religion, um, statistically, I'm sure this group knows this, Catholics are in the middle. Catholics are average Americans right now. So that's kind of a particular, I don't know if it's an advantage, but it's an aspect that is unique to, uh, to Catholics. Um, and also, again, you know, uh, covering religion, th this is the closest thing to an organization that there is maybe. I mean, the, the Catholic Church, even though there, I don't know that there is such a thing, but I mean, that's so, those are attributes that could be, I guess, assets or, or um, I don't know, challenges, but just aspects of thinking about your identity. Okay. Terrence, can I turn the same to you? And, oh, sure. I mean, positive uh, contribution or, or serious liability or, or both? You know, I think one of the uh, liabilities, to, I think to add to what Michelle said, is this idea that we lock people into certain categories, and particularly with the black church, we assume the black church is one monolithic community, and in fact, there are many different you know, uh, black churches. But uh, Professor Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham at, Harg at Harvard argues that, you know, black churches have sort of created something called a counter public sphere. And within this counter public sphere, um, African Americans found different ways to actually to debate to deliberate, sort of to think through both social and cultural issues. And one of the mistakes I think that is sort of tied to what Michelle said is that in that process of debating and deliberating, uh, many African Americans lost the kind of truthfulness in terms of telling America what was actually happening to their communities. And in an effort to um, really support American liberalism, this idea that your voting rights are linked to your human dignity, this idea that if you have equal access, that you can actually acquire something, that in that process, I think now young people are beginning to challenge that and say, wait a minute, what happened to these other sort of counter traditions within black church spaces? In other words, how do you deal with sort of the bad faith that's sort of required, right, to live in a society that says, look, if you're black, you're second class, a second class citizen, but yet you still attempt to enter the public sphere and engage it in a way that gives you some sense of dignity. In other words, there's a strange sense in which you have to sort of live these sort of double lives as an, as an African American, right? You have to pretend that nothing is wrong and yet still try to make sense mm -hmm. of some of the, the horrors you face. And so I think part of the mistake that we see, particularly in the 60s, which is why we see people like Malcolm X uh, and black radical groups emerging, is that black churches were not truthful to the public. And I think one of the, the truths that we did not tell that I think is actually universal is that I think people are very... Um, pluralistic when it comes to religion, in that we have many different sort of these sort of subtexts in terms of how we imagine religious life, but when we talk about our religious life, we, we identify as Catholic or as Jewish, but when you look at what we do at home, in terms of the stories that our grandmothers tell us, in terms of, oh, like in African American communities, if you're sick, you may actually make a remedy in your house that, say, your great-grandfather gave you to actually to, to heal, say, a tummy ache or something. But those kinds of practices often get pushed to the side because we want to show that we are this one religion. We're, we're Jewish or we're Christian, or, you know, we're Protestant. But I think when you look at our practices and how we live our lives, if you look at all the tarot card readers that are in Georgetown that are making lots of money, I think people are very diverse religiously, but we haven't found a way to talk about that in public spaces. So then when we come into public spaces, we identify as one or two things, and I think that contributes to polarization. Because mm -hmm. you're not simply Catholic. You're Catholic in many other things, but for some reason, I think if we feel as if we lose that one <coughs> sort of marker, that somehow we're gonna lose something about our moral fabric. And I think when we look at the internal debates that people have around how do we read scripture, what do we do with women in the church? What are we doing with gays and lesbians and transgender communities? I think they're very kind of nuanced. But when, again, when we enter public spaces, we, we leave that little nuance behind and we don't tell the truth. 
So I think that's something that's happening in African American churches, but I would argue is happening in other congregations as well. Sherry, would you add? Uh, sure, or, actually, I'd love yep. to build on the point that Terrence made, which is one of the most powerful thing, ways I think that um, our faith can contribute either to polarization uh, or its reverse is really through questions of identity. Uh, in that there have been times when the faith has been used to divide, to increase a sense of tribalism, uh, to increase a sense of us versus them, uh, to engage in the heresy hunting that you uh, mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. Mark. Uh, there are other times when uh, our identity as believers in Christ has been used to unite, uh, to orient ourselves towards you know, who we worship, who we love, uh, and to connect us uh, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, I'll note that actually one of the ways where religion has most been used to divide lately uh, is actually through largely its bastardization by politics. Um, our politics, you know, our, our sense of identity, unfortunately, has grown increasingly political. Uh, I saw a survey recently saying that in 2010, 40% uh, of marriages that happened were actually with, between people of different faiths compared to only 22% of different parties. Now, that's a huge inverse from uh, wow. previous years, so a very radical reorientation of how we see ourselves and who we want to link our life with. And at the same time that our identity is becoming increasingly political, our politics is growing increasingly apocalyptic. Uh, you see all that in the rhetoric of the Flight 93 election, you know, the sense that you know, this is freedom's last stand, uh, you know, surveys by the Pew Foundation showing that people who are involved politically feel fear or contempt uh, for people of a different party, uh, and the idea that if you don't do something now, all may be lost, all of which encourages one to think of people from a different party as not merely someone with whom you might have a disagreement over you know, how much do you index capital gains, uh, for example, mm -hmm. but actually as uh, not just the other, but the enemy. And so I think linking in a really unhealthy way uh, faith and politics actually is a powerful way to more deeply divide um, us going forward. Mm. Uh, just uh, uh, in introducing David, uh, David has been my colleague for 17 years on the news hour on Friday nights. And um, I, I can honestly say uh, nobody's ever had a better colleague. Um, he's, uh, he's honest, he's interesting. Uh, he's, uh, he's smart, um, and uh, he's uh, in incredibly thoughtful. Um, and uh, he, uh, uh, his, his wife, Ann, is here tonight as well, um, who uh, graces our presence by being here. Uh, I, uh, David thinks long and hard about uh, these issues, um, and he reports on them. Um, and so I, I turn to you. Uh, David, and uh, uh, with, the, with the understanding that I can end this time at any time. <laughs> I, I can pull the plug. I can say back to the network, okay? But go, go ahead, David Brooks. Thank you for the kind words. I, I've worked with Mark for 17 years. I didn't know he could ask a question. I'd never... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I should also say I want to thank John for mentioning I, earlier on, William F. Buckley was my mentor, and he mentioned I worked at National Review, and I, uh, I came back to mind because the last time I've been in a room with so many Catholics was an editorial board meeting. At <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I just want to salute you for asking outsiders for advice. I'm not sure some of the other groups would do that. Uh, <laughs> Jews too arrogant, uh, Protestants too insecure, so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. <coughs> I guess the first thing I want to say is what is the problem of polarization and incivility? To me, it's not really a problem of politics, it's a problem of culture and sociology, that it's downstream from loneliness. We've had um, 30 or 40 good years of strong individualism and autonomy ethos, and we've reaped the benefits with uh, three overlapping crises. One is a crisis of loneliness. Uh, if you asked Americans, are you lonely 20, 40 years ago, 20% said yes, uh, now 40% say yes. We are at a 30-year high in suicide rates, and that's just a proxy for loneliness. And the second is a crisis of alienation. If you ask people a generation ago, did you trust your neighbors? Clear majority said yes. Now 32% say yes, and only 19% of millennials. And then a crisis of purpose, which is also related to loneliness. And so to me, the reason we have tribal politics is because if you leave people naked and alone, they do what their evolutionary roots tell them to do, which is to revert to tribe. Uh, and they're seeking some form of identity. They don't have anything else, so they go to the party. Mm -hmm. 
and they marry people who are in the party and they identify with the party and they use party to fill all the other multiple sources of identity that used to be filled by ethnicity, by religion, by nation, by anything else. And so to me, you gotta solve the sociological problem of autonomy, of excessive individualism. And so what does Catholicism and Catholic social teaching bring to us? One, it is the primary moral and intellectual system to oppose autonomy. It's basically all we got. It is the ethos of community in this country and the dominant and most developed intellectual tradition of, of community. The second thing Catholic social teaching has for us is a correct anthropology. It has my hero Augustine and his mom, uh, Monica is the, I always say is the <laughs> helicopter mom to beat all helicopter moms. <laughs> uh, but Augustine had the right anthropology that we're not, you know, the meritocracy and frankly probably this institution like where I teach and everywhere else wants to reduce students to human capital centers and sometimes to brains on a stick and to see themselves as resources to be exploited for achievement. But Augustine knew the primary, one of the primary sources of our consciousness was our, our desiring hearts, we're desiring creatures before we were anything else, and the yearnings of our souls. Uh, and we have cut those two off from most people's understanding of themselves. And Catholic social teaching does not do that. And so the anthropology I find among my students is so appealing because they understand that part has, they've been rendered inarticulate about those things. So I teach at Yale, I, I only teach at schools I couldn't have gotten into. Uh, and I, I teach 14 books in the last course I was teaching. And the final um, assignment was pick any one of the 14 books and apply it to a problem in your own life. 19 out of the 24 students in my seminar picked one book, The Long Loneliness by Dorothy Day. And um, so she has the anthropology, she has the service, she has the prayerful life. Uh, she has what my students are hungering for. And so teaching Dorothy Day to those students is like, as I say, it's like being a sprinkler system in the uh, desert. They're just eating it up, they're so hungry. And so that anthropology of understanding their higher desires than success, there's a desire for transcendence, there's a desire for generativity, there are all these higher desires and that there are hierarchies of desire and there are better loves and worse loves and disordered loves. That whole language is so needed. And then the final thing I'd say is the concept of subsidiarity. And here I think Catholic social teaching is a little incomplete for our own needs. I'm correcting 2,000 years of church teaching up here. <laughs> um, but you know, subsidiarity is very valuable right now, even in the political sphere, in the communal sphere. And yet, to me, the problem in our country is not that we don't have some healthy communities and that things at the local level have been done terribly. It's that we have not yet raised up the successes we have at the local level and applied it to the national level. And you can't just be an archipelago of good places if the national level is fundamentally diseased. And so frankly, what I'm doing at this Aspen project is we're just taking local community builders and trying to gather them to see what we can do to take what they're doing at the local level and bring it upward. Uh, and so subsidi subsidiarity is part of that, part of our understanding, but I think it needs another step, not just evolving power down, but taking success down and somehow churning it upward. So that would be my answer. Well, Michelle, add, uh, add react, um, correct? Um, well, I think that, uh, I think there, that, I mean, speaking from the, the journalism perspective, I mean, I, I think that the, um, there are so many things that have the institutions, whether it's you know, religion, the university, media, et cetera, that have sort of fallen and fallen from favor and aren't working. And having you know, it's, it's been an interesting experience to be on. I mean, maybe everybody feels they're on that side in some way, but you know, to be put in cages the way journalists have been lately, and um, it's really I think people are so um, they're they're really disappointed in the institutions around them, but it doesn't mean that they're not, as David said, that they aren't still, you know, a lot of times people say the country's getting more secular, and I don't feel convinced about that at all. I think there are still just the same type of longings, but the way that we're organized has just gotten completely shuffled. Um, and sometimes I think, well, maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, but um, it's going to, 
you know, keep going until people can, uh, you know, reorganize themselves into something. So I guess um, I feel like one of the th one of the things that um, that I that I've looked at again in this uh, this last year that I was on this fellowship was this question of leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I saw, you know, this is my perspective, but, you know, the last couple of years showed me I really didn't, there are a lot of things I didn't understand about the United States. So I really went, I'm already kind of up more on the open-minded, not, you know, advocacy type of journalist, but I've really gone way deeper into just being curious, trying to understand why things are the way that they are. And one of the big holes has been who are the influencers? Who are the religious leaders? Who are the, you know, because we, the people that we were watching misled us as journalists to some degree. So uh, that's another kind of core thing that I, that I, when I was thinking about you guys as leaders is, you know, who are, with all due respect, you know, who are the, the religious influencers and leaders in society? And we have to try to be open, even if it's your, you know, you feel it's part of your institution slipping in influence. You know, is it Colin Kaepernick? Is it Oprah? You know, who are who are the people that are actually inspiring Americans? Um, anyway, that was one thing that we, that I was thinking about was the leadership question. Uh, on that, uh, Terrence, I mean, you you teach leadership. Uh, you you help to develop future leaders. Um, tell us, I mean, just from your, you know, about how to be a leader today. I mean, in your judgment, how is it different today? Um, and uh, what are the, are the challenges? Are the, is there any Catholic aspect to that particular challenge of leadership? Well, I think one of the challenges is even the notion of uh, individualism that David mentioned, and how, how do we take, say, Augustine's ascent, right, with his mom, right, and sort of the privacy of their home, and translate that to kids in this current generation, but also translate that to a culture, right, that has certain norms and, and certain biases and certain traditions, that we often sort of ignore. And on the one hand, I think it's great to want to aspire for the ascent, but my students don't quite know how to translate that. And it's across race, across religion. People are very fearful. And when your identity is attached to an institution like Georgetown, the fear is that when people look different or, or, or outsiders start to come in, then your identity is under attack. And so the question is, how do we translate your identity so it's not in, say, your, necessarily your voting rights or in liberalism, but then how do you translate into a certain kind of freedom? That's some I argue. Or how do you translate into your, 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 your identity is in, say, scripture, which supposedly would sort of help you to transcend culture and tradition? But I find my students really struggle, in part because there's so many different competing demands. And I'm not sure that we in higher education have done a good job of creating spaces where people can have a dialogue right across the table. I mean, I find that my students here, they're really smart, they're great, but in the, the day, they don't talk to each other. Mm. I mean, like, I, I, can, I can identify five different groups in my classroom, in every different classroom, and people are talking at each other, and that's it. And when I walk across campus, it's completely segregated. And I'm not sure we know, we've done a good job of trying to figure out how do we mend that? Because these kids come from very select, very mm -hmm. sort of you know, well-prepared backgrounds, but they, have, they don't have a clue in terms of how to actually have a conversation mm -hmm. about something that is not germane to their life. And that's, and that's part of the problem, I think, with where religion comes in. We, we, so this is why I said we need to be very truthful, because in some respects, the African American church is very interesting. I grew up in a church where I knew there were gays and lesbians, but I didn't know, I didn't have the, the language to identify them, right? But they were well accepted. I mean, people, they were loved, they were cared for. But then once you left that space, people were very rigid about, oh, no, certain acts are forbidden. But yet inside, internally, I'm like, wait a minute. This doesn't make sense because I see gays and lesbians very active in the church. I see women are very active in the church. But yet publicly, the minister would say, well, these people don't have an active role and can't have an active role in our church because this is what scripture says. And so it's this weird kind of tension where we haven't, we're not, we're afraid to allow, um, how do I say it? We assume that the Council of Nicene is not happening right now. Mm. And I think if we were very truthful about the fact that we were always competing with the texts and with our lives, mm -hmm. then, and then I think people will be able to accept an Augustine and then challenge certain cultural norms. But until we say, admit that no, the Bible is a highly contested book, or the Quran is highly contested, or the Torah is highly contested, then I think we're going to go back into the tribalism, and, and, and students will not develop into very rich 
and thoughtful leaders. All right, Sherry, how do we get out of this tribalism? <laughs> how, and lift us up. Well, yes. yeah, I mean, what, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. No, but I, no. It, was, it was very candid and very realistic. Right. But I mean, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking for just a little glimmer of hope. <laughs> uh, well, a few ideas. Before I get to the ideas, just to build on something both David and, and Terrence were saying, um, the students who can't talk with each other and the loneliness issue. I think one thing that needs to be recognized is just what an enormous problem, even a crisis, loneliness is. Uh, and I think there are means of formation that the Catholic Church is uniquely uh, situated to speak into uh, to address that crisis. But you know, historically, loneliness has really been concentrated among the elderly. Um, mm -hmm. They're more isolated, uh, mm -hmm. less mobile. Um, yep. and, and actually what we see even among the, the elderly is really alarming. I've, there's different AARP surveys that show that essentially the percentage of the elderly who uh, self-report as being chronically lonely has increased from 20% to essentially 35% just in the last decade. But what's even more alarming is there are recent studies that actually kind of put that sort of historical trend on its head and show that by some uh, studies, Gen Z, the 18 to 22 year olds, are actually the most lonely people uh, in the country. Uh, the most isolated, the ones who report feeling uh, the most rejected and alone. And of course, loneliness is very different than solitude. Um, you know, solitude is a discipline. Uh, loneliness includes feelings of rejection, isolation, um, being cast out in a sense. And that is growing at a really alarming rate uh, in the country. And that is something I think that the Catholic Church is really uniquely situated uh, to speak into, uh, to call people to a different way of thinking about this and a different way of acting. And it's uh, something that I think every parishioner can do. Um, for example, the practice of hospitality is such a modest yet incredibly potent antidote to addressing the crisis of loneliness in the country. It's something that anyone can do um, to have someone over, to actually engage in a conversation. Even if the conversation is stilted, you know, practice can help. Um, that simple practice of hospitality, it may not be sufficient to address the crisis of loneliness, but loneliness will never be addressed without it. Uh, a second way, a formational way, is the practice of reading. You know, we as Christians and as Jews are people of the book. We believe in deep reading. Uh, reading in every way has been correlated with positive, uh, more community-oriented outcomes rather than individualistic. People who read deeply are much more likely to be involved in the community, are more likely to volunteer, uh, to give generously, to look out for others, to vote. Almost every single kind of pro-social, pro-civic, and pro-community indicator is correlated with reading. Um, on the other hand, on the inverse, it is negatively correlated with electronic entertainment consumption. And of course, that's where everything is going. Those are the trend lines. Uh, just as a quick tangent from that, all the trend lines that we see in the future are probably likely to further exacerbate the crisis of loneliness. When you look at robotics, AI, virtual reality, all this has the uh, impact of basically separating us from other people. And as Catholics, you also have a rich theology of the body um, and know the importance of what embodied relationship and community means, that it cannot uh, be replicated. There's certainly advantages to be able to keep in touch with someone by Facebook or you know, tweet, whatever, but, uh, but it does not replace embodied in-person communication. Uh, and I think a third way of addressing it, again, none of these are necessarily sufficient to the task, uh, but I think they're all necessary if insufficient, is simply a recovery of moral language. And who better to do this than the church? Uh, it, those of you who are students of literature who've read Orwell's 1984 know that one of like the central parts of 1984 was basically the totalitarians changed language. They restricted vocabulary, they restricted concepts, uh, which was an artistic way of rendering the fact that when you change your language, you change not, you change how you think. And when we increasingly use a highly politicized language in the public square, a highly divisive form of language, we actually weaken and innervate our ability to think morally, spiritually, relationally, and communally in the public square. So those are just three quick ways I think Boy. the church can, can add. 
Okay. Go ahead, David. I guess. The, <laughs> okay, positive. I'll bring us down again. Uh, I should say those statistics of Sheree's statistics on read, deep reading and pro-social behavior. That was not my experience at the University of Chicago. <laughs> uh, we had no pro-social behavior and a lot of deep reading. The president endorses your position. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I want to tease out something. Uh, Terence had said about truthfulness, and I think it's an, a good distinction to make between uh, civility uh, and uh, c citizenship. Because sometimes when the truth comes out, it's not always civil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, actually, frankly, Black Lives Matter is part of a truth telling that is not always pleasant for anybody, but a, probably a necessary truth telling. What's happening on college campuses, frankly, I'm unsure. When you say people aren't talking, is that a truth telling? or is it just a, an up, upping of angry nastiness? Mm -hmm. Now, I teach at Yale, as I mentioned, and I will, a friend of mine who teaches at NYU says, if you haven't been on a college campus in the last four years, you don't know what's happening. Hmm. And that's been my experience. Things have changed, and it's an unfurling of moral passion in ways that are good and bad. Hmm. And you had mentioned the students here, sometimes not talking, I hope I don't embarrass my wife, Anne, uh, went to a, it was a guest lecture at a class, that E.J. Dion was, gives here at Georgetown. I do NPR with E.J. I do commentary with any pundit so long as they're Catholics from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and she talked in the class, really broke out into a pretty vituperative debate between left and right. Uh, pretty nasty. Uh, and so to what extent is that just a purging of people being hidden? And to what extent is that a, an exacerbation of, of victimology stories? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but that's but part of it. But n mere truth-telling is not incivility. The, the thing that I think the crucial thing that separates righteous truth-telling from tribalism is the background mentality behind it. And in a lot of our philosophers, including some I used to like in college, Hobbes and Locke particularly, the state of nature is a state of nastiness. Mm. And there's a state of, there's a scarcity mentality that life is zero sum uh, and that it's a battle of group against group. And a lot of people, in my view, go into politics with the scarcity mentality, with an under threat mentality. For Jews, Muslims, Catholics, and Protestants, we start at the Garden of Eden. And that teaches us there's an abundance mentality that there's room for all. And that basically there, you know, the arc of justice bends, or the arc of history bends toward justice. And so that abundance mentality puts you in a very different position. And it puts you in a position to build community not out of hate, which is what tribalism, or difference, which is what tribalism is, but out of love and affection and attachment. And then you can have, which is inherent in subsidiarity, a nestling of your attachments. Not one attachment and one group against another, but a nesting of them, one on top of the other, or one next to each other. And so going back to that original sense of what your condition is, scarcity or abundance, is to me what separates tribalism from real community. Okay. Michelle, wh wh where is the, is the voice of the Catholic community on, on this debate or, or this dilemma that uh, we're just addressing? Um, I mean, is it, is, it, is it exacerbating it? Uh, the, the, the problem, or is it, is, is it in any way, uh, are Catholic, the Catholic teaching or leadership, as you cover it mm. and, and confront it, I mean, is it, is it re where is it remedying that, that polarization and that, that dark, despairing, uh, David Brooks <laughs> <laughs> landscape of the country. Well, one of, one of the things that, uh, if you'll bear with the generalization, that I've always noticed covering like religious conferences is that if I walk into a conference and in general, if it's an evangelical conference, people are much more like culturally apt in how they look versus a Catholic conference. Like, so there's, there's much more of a like, a desire to blend it, to, to engage with the culture, and in, 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 I'm obviously generalizing among evangelicals, like that culture is part of the back and forth. And I feel like often Catholics are more traditional, maybe because we have such a large, stable, 
institution compared to a lot of other parts of American religion. So I think give an example. Give an example. I mean, of, 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 uh, of what two. I'm, yeah, I mean, the, the evangelical versus the Catholic. just like more hipster looking, more into branding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, ju I'm just saying. There's. I'm, I'm generalizing to make a yeah, point. No, that's which skinny is like, jeans, felt hair. Yeah. Well, I just mean. No, I just. Yeah, I just mean. There's like a, an acknowledgement of the power of culture. Okay. And I feel like that the Catholic Church is such a such a big institution that's still so stable that sort of sometimes there there isn't necessarily as as much of a desire to reach out into the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you don't have the 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 power of popular culture hasn't been tapped in a way. You know, I mean, so you don't have a lot of. Um, you know, just if you ask your average American, if they would say like, "Who's a Catholic that they know?" Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. The, I mean, obviously today, the yeah. Pope Francis people are, has has obviously succeeded in doing that. Um, so I don't know if that's a positive or negative. It depends on on your perspective. I mean, some people love the fact that they aren't expecting to get a supercharged, you know, super, you know, I don't want to say relevant, but political, socially, uh, you know whatever, very very uh, present kind of um, homily in church if they're Catholic. But I think there is also, so you could say that a lot of times you haven't seen Catholic leadership plunge into the most controversial aspects. Like people think of somebody like Paul Ryan as the Catholic that they know. But on the other hand, they're not, it, you, there's an opportunity there to be like more engaged with, um, with this conversation. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, if you, it's hard to imagine what it would be like if Pope Francis wasn't the pope right now, because he's made such a huge impact on this conversation. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. Terrence, the, it, 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 it's an interesting point, though, about the spoken word, too, I mean, that, that Michelle addressed, that um, it's so much a, a part of the, of the black church tradition, mm -hmm. um, and I would say far more in the Protestant tradition than it is in the Catholic. Um, and is, that a, is that a failure of of Catholic leadership in your judgment? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I, I wouldn't say that. I wonder if the black church would be a model in terms of how it has combined both the word uh, along with song. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, everyone knows this, but you know, the popularity of hip hop in our, in our country and the number uh, of white audience listeners of that music, I find that my students are very much aware of what's happening culturally, particularly my white students, but they don't have sort of a public space or a venue to actually articulate what they're hearing right. and actually sh either show solidarity and or criticize or, or do both uh, and still find some kind of acceptance. I find that students who are very engaged socially and they're white often feel very marginal, mar marginalized in their own community, but also marginalized from other students. And so, I'm wondering, what is the Catholic Church doing then to embrace them? I mean, clearly you have uh, the father out in L.A. with his Homeboys, um, the Homeboys Initiative. Yeah, Greg Boyle. Yeah. Mm. You have That's Chicago. A There's a, a, yep. Uh, so there, it's definitely out there, but I'm wondering, as an institution, what are they doing to combine, and this is for the black church as well, how do we listen to non-canonical texts to help us understand what's happening? And right now, hip-hop is, is preaching a certain kind of gospel that most people don't want to hear. But if you look at the Black Lives Matter marches, they're very integrated in most places. But we often assume it's only black people out there. But there are a number of Catholics who are out there who are involved, but we don't necessarily shed light on that for some reason. Yeah. And we're not taking these non-economical texts and making, trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this material? Yeah. But I think there's a, a lot of sort of gem in, in those materials. Yeah. All right, Sherry, you, you, you've got the microphone, the <laughs> megaphone, and you say Catholics, Catholic Church, you could do this better, and it would reduce polarization, <laughs> and, and no, but and, and contribute to the kind of community, the national community you've described. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that comes to mind, I think actually Catholics have done a much better job than, um, you know, I grew up within an evangelical um, community, mm -hmm. Southern Baptist background, even slightly fundamentalist, uh, kind of now go to an Anglican church, kind of moving your way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I actually think one thing that the Catholics have done so much better than the evangelical background that I came out of is not being entirely co-opted uh, by one divisive wing of a political party, um, in that you know, the Catholic social teaching seems to spread, be far less easier to, you know, sort of easily pigeonhole mm -hmm. uh, and be co-opted by one party. And now, I use the term evangelical at this point. 
I have to say, I don't know if I'm an evangelical anymore. It's not because my theology has changed radically, but when, I, when you read that 80% of evangelicals voted for Trump, 75% affirm his leadership and think he's doing a great job, you, know, you realize that more people affirm the leadership of Donald Trump than affirm the doctrine of the virgin birth, and you think, you know, what does it even mean to be an evangelical? So I mean, I think that's just one example of how um, a term has almost become meaningless uh, because um, you know, essentially, a re religious denomination uh, has become co-opted. And I think one thing that is a strength of the Catholic Church is that it has not been nearly as easily co-opted uh, by, by certain political powers and uh, basically pigeonholed away. You know, Catholic social teaching isn't, doesn't easily fit into one party. Mm. And I think that is a strength. Um, I think that is, um, in a way, unavoidable uh, if one is going to be tr prophetic and true uh, to the faith. And I think that's something that should be protected um, and perhaps more, um, more strongly and more frequently vocalized. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have three random thoughts. I mean, one is uh. just a thought. Um, <laughs> what what happened, like in my view, the evangelical Protestantism is in a moment of crisis and leading up to a moment of probably greater crisis. Uh, and it's caused by latching on to a political figure who will not be around forever. Mm -hmm. uh, two, uh, a vast generational gap. So most evangelicals under 40 don't recognize their own movement, in my experience, including at the Christian colleges. And caused, and I've said this at one evangelical gathering after another, by a weird mixture of a, a, a spiritual superiority complex combined with an intellectual inferiority complex, <laughs> which is a dangerous combination, actually. <laughs> Uh, and so what, what happens as American e evangelicalism goes into a crisis mm -hmm. and a loss of identity, how does that affect the Catholic world? Mm -hmm. Does it bleed over? Does it? I think it does. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of young people, uh, we have a dear friend mm -hmm. named Pete Wainer, he said this publicly, and he said, I have two major identities in my life. I'm a Republican evangelical, and in the last year, suddenly I'm neither of those two. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of people like that. Mm -hmm. And so then how does the Catholic Church respond with those people sort of floating around? Uh, it seems to me, I don't know if it's an evangelical opportunity, but maybe an alliance opportunity, I don't know what. The second thing is what do we do in a moment of institutional crisis? The Catholic Church is an institution. Uh, and when I go around college campuses, I've been asking young people of who they believe in. What change agents do they believe in? Mm -hmm. And one question I always ask is, who are your heroes? And that produces a long silence <laughs> before we get to Pope Francis and Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> those, are the, those are the two who come up. Uh, <laughs> there's a pair that be three of a kind. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the second thing that we inevitably end up talking about is what institutional structures do you believe in? And so for those of us of a certain age, we're used to movements that were a movement of a lot of people with a famous person on top. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, Ralph Nader, Gloria Steinem. But the movements that thrive today are radically de decentralized movements with no famous person on top. Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the Tea Party, Occupy. Mm -hmm. And so they just do not, do not trust hierarchical institutions and want to see something much more radically decentralized. And so, and as my friend and colleague Yuval Levin says, one of the problems is institutions have stopped becoming formative. They change, changing and molding the people within them, and they've become more performative. They've become platforms on which individuals can express themselves. Mm. Uh, and that's a good insight from Levin. Don't steal it, because he's writing a book on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, um, but so how does a church that's super hierarchical deal with a world that has become mm -hmm. super anti-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing I'll say, and this is the dumbest and most obvious thing, and it's something we've all experienced in life, you know, we live polarization every day, and we live with the ugliness every day, and what do we do um, to, to feel better? Well, one of the things I did every year was accept John Carr's invitation to appear at Catholic Charities with Mark Shields. Yes. And there was a guy there who named Father Ray East, now Monsignor Ray East, if some of you know him, just a golden, beautiful individual. 
And the people in that room are doing beautiful work. And it's just the reason people love Dorothy Day is because there are a lot of Dorothy Days around. Hmm. And so that's the work that is not only good for the people who are being served on the margins of society, but are, that is the healing work for all of us that we all want to be part of. And so, I mean, that's the core mission. And that, out of that moral um, beauty comes inspiration and eventually will become political union. But it's going to take a social repair before we fix the politics. Okay, who has a question here? And it's always ideal when given a question, if you can frame it as a question. Yeah. Yes, right, yep. Excuse me. Um, I don't know if everybody heard what I said, but one of the things that's happened to us in my lifetime and the lifetime of many of us is that many things have transpired that we would not have imagined would transpire. I mean, going back to the fall of the wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the election of Barack Obama. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many times I said to people, I don't think I'm going to be alive to see a black American president, but here I am still standing. And I guess one of the things that, um, well, in our state, in the state of Maryland, I'm from Maryland, um, a, a Kennedy in one of the most liberal states, if not the most liberal state in the union, was defeated by a, you know, a no-name Republican, Robert Ehrlich. Um, so, I guess that sort of led me to the, confu to the conclusion that um, we don't really know who we are anymore. I mean, who, how many times in the past 20 years have the, the experts um, predicted incorrectly who is going to win the next election? 43. And so, <laughs> so, I mean, so it just makes me wonder, you know, do we still know who we are as Americans? Do we, do okay. we still have a kind of handle on um, who we are? And does anybody have any sense of how we can recover that? And the sorts of things that are being said now about the youngest people in our society, the youngest voters, is that they're moving much more into direct, the direction of a kind of anonymous democracy. You know, that seems like they're moving in the direction of it's going to be increasingly harder to know who we are. So I guess I just wonder, does anybody have any sense of how to recover that sense of what the American public amounts to. What are the leading principles that are guiding people? Um, what are okay. the desires of <laughs> okay. these people? Uh, well, um, the, uh, let, me, let me just drop my moderator's hat for a second and say one of the, one of the unifying, cohering experiences of a country and of this country uh, has been a universally shared national experience. Whether it was war or there was depression, uh, and uh, that, that does unify where everybody is speaking. I, I can honestly say that I've never been more of an American uh, than I grew up when there was a universal draft. And if you could see lightning and hear thunder, you served in the military. Um, and uh, the, uh, the first time I ever slept in the same quarters with African Americans, I took orders as a matter of course from African Americans, was at Paris Island, South Carolina, in Marine Corps boot camp. And at, I, I was exposed to people who were entirely different from me. I'd grown up, I'd, I'd gone to college, uh, I was an Irish Catholic from Boston, and I, I met people who were Baptists from Louisiana and, uh, and Mormons from Utah and people I'd never known, and after the end of 13 weeks, I, I depended on them, they depended on me. Uh, there was a sense of, of unity and, 
uh, a spree uh, that I've never seen replicated in the private sector. Uh, and uh, I, I would, you know, I would start with a, a, a national experience that's universal uh, as, a, as an antidote to that isolation autonomy that has been referred to. Um, and I, uh, th that's, I don't want to say it's a cure-all, uh, but uh, when, when one does uh, experience that uh, together, uh, there, there is a, a sense of citizenship that emerges from it and is with you. But go ahead, please try it, Terrence. No, no but I'm wondering, what if we also, uh, along with that sort of national identity motif, also pushed to, or, or, or believe that and challenge this idea that no, we've always had competing themes. We've always been sort of wrestling with our tribalism, and we've always we, we've not been perfect. And I think if that's the starting point, then we're going to ask different questions at this moment now. I mean, I think people, I think, give Trump way too much credit. I think he just basically pinpointed a lot of pain. And if he weren't racist, he probably would have many more African Americans. When I listen to him, he sounds like someone from the '60s, right? He this idea of of, of the, the big state, this idea of institutions. I mean, black folk have been saying that forever, right? It's, he, it's not unusual. The difference is they wanted to belong to a community, right? They wanted to expand it. It seems as if he wants to sort of close it. And so I would argue that if we recognize that, look, we have a very troubled history. But at the, and with that troubled history, we've always had this ideal that we've tried to, to live up to. Then I think we're not so tied to you know, our skin. We're not so tied to our bodies, right? We're able to have that kind of ascent moment. But we can't have that ascent moment if we want to hold on to a past that never actually existed, but that we have created in order to maintain sort of power structures and power dynamics. Yeah. I could just say one thing, I was in this room a couple months ago talking to Georgetown students, and I said, listen, I grew up with a certain national narrative, which was an exodus narrative. Mm -hmm. We fled oppression, we crossed the wilderness, and we came to the promised land. And that was the narrative the founders basically believed in, the Puritans sir did, the founders wanted to put Moses on the seal. Yeah. That was the immigrant narrative. Every immigrant family had that. Mm -hmm. It was the King's narrative and the civil rights movement. And I said, does this rings true? And as has happened in every college on my tour, I said, nah, are you crazy? That's not our narrative. Yeah. Like, this is a promised land. Have you looked around? And so I think we're at a moment where we just have to accept that and have an find another narrative. Mm -hmm. And to me, the most persuasive narrative is Lincoln's second inaugural which is a redemption narrative. This is an experiment, it's been betrayed, but we can repair it and redeem it. And I'm, I was struck, I happened to see a Wells Fargo ad on TV, if you're watching <laughs> They're like, we were great, we screwed up, we came back. <laughs> uh, Pizza Hut did that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good, it's a good narrative. Yeah. Frankly, for a church that's had a few scandals, not so bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so it's, I, I just, We've lost a narrative, and okay, we accept that fact, it face our reality, but there's another redeeming narrative that, that we can shift over to, I think. Michelle. Um, yeah, just, I, I, I mean, I agree with what these guys are saying. It made me think of, you know, this idea of the media, and we're like, I can't believe that we, you know, how come everybody hates us all of a sudden? It's like, my whole life I've been going to supermarkets, and you see everybody buying the National Enquirer. Yes. <laughs> Why was I ever paying attention yeah. to the huge numbers of people that were buying the National Enquirer? And I don't know if the, if the data, I mean, one of the things that people talk a lot about about religion, maybe they do in other topics as much, is just polling. And maybe our polling, we've had problems with the polling that guided a lot of our public conversations. I mean, talk about the word evangelical. And, you know, I just stopped in recent years like 12 years ago, and I would talk to people about their faith journey, and I would say, tell me about your religion. Are you religious? Like these type of words or, you know, whatever. They, I could tell people just were not responding to that entire line of questioning. And we did a little, some, something we did for the Protestant Reformation where we allowed a bunch of pe people, like hundreds of people, to write in. And, and we said, what's your religion? Or I forget how we put it, describe your religion. And people could put whatever they wanted. And there was such a range of how people describe themselves. I mean, they're overwhelmingly Christian, but it wasn't, the point is maybe the language we've been using, part of this feeling of who are we, is that some of the, some of the language we were using wasn't, wasn't very specific. Um, and I just try not, I mean, maybe this is the wrong place to say this, but you know, there's so much advocacy in journalism today that I don't identify with, and I feel like we can't really, I don't wanna say I'm not an advocate of peace, but you have to cover war sometimes. I mean, I, can't, I, I don't even wanna say I'm against polarization because it's something that is happening right now. So I think our rush to kind of find another 
another, uh, not another narrative, but to heal our polarization is like maybe the wrong question sometimes. I apologize for the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry. This is like probably the most basic point ever, but I do think one thing that's important as well is it's not only important to have a narrative, uh, but to teach the narrative for people to know the narrative. Uh, you know, when you read surveys about how, you know, 40 percent of you know, college freshmen think, uh, you know, essentially curtailing freedom of speech, you know, to prevent someone's feelings from being hurt is not such a bad thing. It's actually helpful. Uh, you know, it makes you think, well, they're, they're, perhaps they have not been taught or not seriously engaged with just how precious and important free speech is. You know, how, how rare it is historically and around the world, uh, why it should be valued. It, if they, you know, s still believe that, it's, you know, they're at least making an informed decision as opposed to kind of slouching uh, into an assumption uh, that uh, may never have been examined. You know, kind of throughout the Old Testament, there's always, uh, you know, with the Exodus narrative, remember, remember, you know, write on your hearts, write on your clothing, you know, just write, you know, make sure, pass this along. And I think, again, it's a terribly basic point, but one thing we do need to do is, is simply teach it, engage it, um, you know, make sure that they, they know the story um, so that the critique that is offered can at least be an informed critique. That's good. No, it was another. Yes, John. Oh, Father had a question? Yes, Father. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Father Kenneth Taylor, I'm the uh, president of the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus, a priest of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And I uh, uh, was really struck by the comments about loneliness and isolationism and, and all of that. Um, I can uh, verify what you said about suicides. And when you mentioned the Garden of Eden, it just struck me that one word we have not heard mentioned at all tonight, and hardly this week, is sin. Hmm. That's part of our, uh, still part of our Catholic theology and our Catholic story, but even we don't talk about sin that much. <laughs> Would talking about sin help or hurt uh, the cause of polarization? Hmm. It was a total winner for the Puritans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> hey, in retrospect, the Puritans weren't bad. Yeah, no, I, I, if I could start. Um, you know, I, I um, wrote this book, uh, The Road to Character, and I was on, I can now say this, I was on Charlie Rose. What? <laughs> and I, I was talking. Enabler. <laughs> and I was talking about um, my book, and I was talking about sin all the time. And I got an email from another publisher in uh, New York, a very great editor, actually, and he said, you know, I love the way you're talking about your book, but I wouldn't use the word sin. It's such a downer. <laughs> and he said, use the word insensitive. Like, <laughs> and but, this was, but I talked about sin a lot in the book, and the, the question was, how do you do it in this world that we're in? And so I uh, called a friend of mine who, uh, a Protestant, very famous Protestant pastor who has a public figure, Tim Keller, uh, and he said, use disordered loves. Say, we all love a lot of things, uh, and what well, we all know loves, some loves are higher than others, and sometimes we get them out of order. If your friend tells you a secret and you blab it at a dinner party, you've put your love of popularity above your love of friendship, and, you, and we know that's wrong. And that's a way of talking about sin without talking about depravity. Mm -hmm. And I found that was, at least for me as a secular writer, that was a way to do it. And I'm, I'm like, I tell pastor or clergy friends, I'm, I'm the gateway drug to you. I just try to <laughs> talk about this stuff in public so eventually they'll get to you. Uh, and, um, but I, I do think it's hard in this climate to talk about sin in the, the straight up way. And there have, to, there have to be conversions that maybe a Fulton Sheen didn't have to do or a Richard or Reinhold Niebuhr didn't have to do, or mm -hmm. Abraham Joshua Heschel didn't have to do, because they were living in a different climate. Sin, uh, is that verboten, Terrence? Is that unacceptable in the public dialogue today? You know, I was thinking of James Cone, as, like James Cone, as you were talking, and I'm wondering, you know, we can use the term as long as we recognize group sin as well, and not simply individual sin. What do we do about the group, group sin of slavery? How do we account for that both as an institution, right, um, and, and familiarly. And so I think with that kind of nuance, I think sin is actually, could be very healthy. And the young people I talk to, 
want to talk about sin, but in a very nuanced way. Um, yes, as a kind of depravity, but also as the ways in which um, institutions, right, have harmed groups of people but and neglected them. I mean, I ask this as an honest question. They talk about their own sin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hmm. Jerry, sin. Upper <laughs> sin, sin some more. <laughs> I'll take sin for 400. That's right. <laughs> The danger with the term sin is that I think it is so often weaponized against those who are already um, the most hurt, the most vulnerable, the most in need of help. Um, it is a vitally important <coughs> concept. I think often it is misused and because it has been misused and abused, there's um, ugly baggage around it. In fact, there's sin around the use of sin. <laughs> um, I think almost everyone will agree that they are broken in places, that they are bent towards selfishness, uh, that there is something wrong with them. They are not whole. And so sometimes I think just a vocabulary change um, can make the concept um, resonate uh, and take the poison, the, the weaponized poison out of a really an acknowledgement that is the first step towards healing. Hmm. But then my evangelical friends will say, you're just watering it down, become very liberal, become very American. Well, I mean, I think. And that's why we're, we're upset that you guys are hijacking our religion. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh -huh. yeah. the problem, yeah. of course, is not the, the use of the term itself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's understanding the concept. It's understanding why we are in need of a savior, and why we are broken and insufficient on our own. Would the Washington Post use sin outside of a qu quotation? Sure. We, d we did a story, I'm trying to remember now if it was oh. me that did, I think I did a story with, about evangelicals debating, this is sort of a generational story, whether racism or abortion was a bigger sin. Hmm. And it wasn't in, in quotes. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, I don't think we have a shared language. I mean, this is a whole question around right. language as the country becomes more pluralistic and as we talk more honestly about what all Catholics actually think and all Protestants and that kind yep. of thing is, will we ever have a shared language around these ideas? I, I just uh, add one, one PS before I turn it back to John. I, I think one of the reasons for polarization, I'm more hopeful about it, uh, but one of the contributing factors to polarization has been language in our, in our public debate. Um, if, if you and I disagree on an issue and I say you're mistaken uh, or I think you're, uh, you're not, not completely informed, or maybe a logic is, that's one thing, and it doesn't in any way preclude our working together in the future. But when I say to you, you're immoral, uh, you're evil, um, uh, it, that, that does, that, that not only brands you, uh, it, it would make me then suspect if I collaborate or coalesce with you in the future. And, and our language has, to, has served to isolate us uh, the excessive use of the moral uh, reprobation in our, in our, our rhetoric. Uh, I, think, uh, I think both sides, it's not, a, it's not an either side exclusive. Um, you, you choose your issue, uh, but that, that language has been isolating and alienating, uh, and, uh, and, and I think at a, at a real cost. And I think it's something that uh, uh, we have to be aware of. I, uh, please join me in thanking the panelists who are just terrific. John Carr, will, John Carr will now lead the second collection. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm just dying to know, and this violates the rule, uh, David, why people think Pope Francis is a hero and what our outsiders think of Pope Francis, and then we'll ask Father John for a prayer. And the moderator can answer this question as well. Why do the young people choose Pope Francis and what does our panel think about Pope Francis' role in all this? Uh, well, you know, I said this uh, on Georgetown about four years ago, whatever their faith, people like a human being who acts like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Can't improve on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Aretha Franklin did it, you know, at the singing of Amazing Grace, I think it was, when, it, when Pope Francis came to the U.S. But, but students love him. I mean, I think uh, sort of the, the battle on Twitter sort of brought him to life for, for a number of people who were not Catholic and saw a level of, of courage that 
we hadn't witnessed for a very long time. So I think that was also, that was very appealing. The battle on Twitter with him, or, would, or just his presence? His presence on Twitter, Oh, his yes. presence, yeah. oh, okay. You, you've covered him, Michelle, you covered the visit. Yeah, yeah, that was fascinating. Um, every morning waking up at 6 a.m. in terror of the <laughs> news conference that had already happened in Rome, um, and what we were already behind on. Um, yeah, I just think it's, I mean, this is such a cheesy word today, the authenticity. I mean, I think people just want, they, they want to be surprised by what, I mean, maybe, maybe people aren't surprised by what he says, but I mean, the idea that it's not always going to be the same. It's going to be something genuine. It might be, not, not that this is, I'm comparing the two, but it reminded me of like when, people, when Russell Moore spoke out about the Confederate flag and people mm -hmm. were following him, is because they, they could, you know, there was a sense of authenticity that, um, and I think uh, it's kind of been interesting that people haven't followed him quite as much, the Pope, in the last year or so. And I don't know if that's because our attention spans are mm -hmm. like, oh, we kind of, you know, okay, he's a huge figure and he's awesome or people don't like him or whatever. But I wonder if he, in what way he's going to come back again and if it's going to be kind mm -hmm. of the conversation around the reality that he isn't going to live forever or he may retire, as he said. And so that could kind of um, bring the attention back to him again. Mark? Uh, I, I think that, uh, in a strange way, uh, the Catholic Church uh, has suffered from the same problem that American liberals have, and that they uh, love uh, humankind. They're just not very good with people. Uh, and uh, whatever one thinks of Francis, and I, I think uh, extraordinarily highly of him, um, he's awfully good with people. He, is, and he's, he goes to people. Um, it, it was the case in Buenos Aires, the case in Argentina. Um, he was, a, he was a, a priest of the people. He was a bishop of the people. He was a, uh, he's a pope of the people. And uh, uh, the, I, I recommend, I, I'm not a movie critic, but I recommend the film. Uh, my, my wife, uh, Anne, who uh, I, I think it's fair to say is not uncritical in matters of the Catholic Church, um, is, uh, was uh, just as uh, impressed by it as I am, I mean, and, and it comes back to Michelle's word, authenticity. I mean, this is, this is not contrived. This is not off a, uh, off a, 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 a speech card or any of this sort. It's not three points. Uh, it, it, you know, he's, it, it's just who he is. And uh, I, I, think it, uh, I, I think it does come through in a, at, a, at a yearning at a time when, um, you know, so much is driven by focus groups. Uh, I mean, that David's citing the, the Wells Fargo ad being a perfect example. I mean, uh, what do we do? Uh, let's do a mea culpa. Uh, you know, just fleece five million people. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's all right. Uh, you know, not created accounts, but my God, we were great in 1849. <laughs> no, I, so I, I, think, I think that, you know, at, at a time when everybody feels they're being diddled one way or the other from some some external force. I mean, he, he just seems like the real deal. And whatever you say, the fiat, when he arrived on that hair, and every self-important jerk in Washington's in his SUV or his you know, limo out of their tarmac, and they feel like fools because the, the vicar of Rome gets in the back seat of a fiat to, to drive, a little bitty fiat to drive through. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the real thing. I used the language, I said we were having outsiders, then I said in-laws, and then I was thinking cousins. I think what we've got are sisters and brothers. Yeah. So let's ask Father John to close with prayer. Oh, I have my thanks. You were spectacular. Really, thank you so much. You're so great. So I wrote this the other day. It's about sin. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but a little about sin. Listen carefully. These last two days, I've been, I've been reflecting upon my attitude toward the thoughts, or perspectives of all those sharing these days together. I've been particularly conscious of my own unwillingness to move beyond my clearly defined thoughts, even had some negative judgment, not just about what was spoken, but who was saying those words. I suspect you had some of the same feelings and reactions. After all, in our humanness, it's not hard to hear, it is hard to hear opinions so diametrically opposed 
to our own. Remind them my, one of my principles that might be worth reflecting upon to bring this evening to a close. I'm known in this diocese as a priest who always tries to say yes. I often get frustrated with people whose first response is almost always an emphatic no. What if all of us listened with open hearts and are willing to train ourselves to give positive response rather than negative response to issues and struggles that are placed before us? What if we were so open we would hear things differently for the very first time? What if that person whose opinions and thoughts are so different was thought to be your friend? What if that yes that comes from your heart begins to guide your relationships, not just with those present, but those back home who often draw out from us the most negative response? So our principle of life, of our priesthood is simply this. Say yes, every time you can say yes, and no only when you have to. Say yes every single time you can say yes. No, no, and no only when you have to. I wonder if that would work for me just as well, my reaction to others, as it does in my actions towards those I meet. So very briefly, let us pray. Where we continue to grow in our willingness to hear and reflect on another's perspective different than our own. Help us this day to listen carefully, reflect honestly, and open our heart to your will. May our yes to each other, and our yes to an open and probing mind, allow us to form a foundation of conversion that moves towards the community we're called to be. And all this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.